Thank you so much, Nick. And, and thank you all for being that kind of punks. Uh, <laughs> I think that you are giving me a lot of credit. I think that the real credit right now is in Cuba, in the streets of Cuba, in, the, in that big amount of people that probably hundreds of thousands of Cubans that are in the streets, that were in the streets still um, since Sunday and that, uh, and that today are being repressed in, a, in the most cruel and violent way that we can even imagine. When we, when we, I have to say, when we fantasize about this day coming, uh, there was always this feeling that, no, the Cuban military is not going to crack down in, against their own people. They're not going to do it. Well, they are doing it. And they are doing it in a very violent, in a very, in a very cruel way. They are kids that are dead right now. They are a lot of young people and not so young people. I have a lot of friends missing right now. A lot of friends detained, a lot of friends facing criminal charges. All this is taking place in Cuba, and at the same time, on Sunday we had we had the the best news I have had in my whole life, and that news was the Cuban people is in the streets demanding freedom, demanding the end of the demanding the end of the dictatorship. That people need support. That people need all of us to elevate their voices. Their voices are very, are, very, are very clear. They are asking for the end of the dictatorship. We just need to elevate that, that message and to make those that have the power to help them with concrete actions to take that action. That kind of pressure has to come from us, and, uh, and that's the depth that we have with those heroes. Thank you, Nick. So, uh, and, and I might pass the microphone back to you because you might have other things to say on this subject, but earlier today, sort of on a whim, uh, Mike and I were in touch with Carmen, who is um, one of the, the staffers or volunteers or whatever the appropriate thing might be with Cuba de Cide. One of the things that Cuba de Cide does is um, to maintain the cell phone plans of a, a vast network of people in Cuba uh, who are doing everything from uh, coordinating each other to informing people in the outside uh, world off of the island about what is going on in Cuba. And to my knowledge, and I, 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 I don't think that this is a secret, but it's always a struggle to fund all of those cell phones. Yes. Um, and so, you know, uh, this is a thing that Mike and I have talked about for a long time, and I think that we finally are in a window where there's enough interest to, to fund that. And so we went ahead and we, we got in touch with Carmen and said, if we told people to send money to keep those cell phones functioning, where should they send it? And it was a Venmo thing, and it was the uh, Ariad Hospitality Group. Uh, shout out to uh, new Cuban hero, uh, Andrew Falsetto, and whoever <laughs> else you want to shout out, Mike Beltran. Um, uh, uh, we'll be matching contributions to that fund up to five grand. Um, and, and that's a thing that everybody here, you know, can contribute to in some way, shape or form. Uh, if you go on, on Instagram, uh, you'll find the information about that in our posts and in our stories. But I, I just want to hand the microphone back to you to if there's something that you would want people here to take back home about how might I contribute? What should I have in mind about what to do in my position? Yes, thank you again, Nick. Uh, I think that the, the most important thing is, is to spread the voice. I mean, the people woke up on Sunday with the news that the Cuban people will, was protesting in the streets in a massive way, in a transversal way. At least 45 towns and cities were protesting on, on Sunday. And we're talking about all the major cities. We're talking about, we are, we are talking about that that moment that we have been trying to provoke for so many years. Now that moment is, uh, is taking place. What do we need? We need everybody to realize that the real problem, the real conflict, because there are a lot of noise also coming from the dictatorship, coming from the propaganda of the dictatorship, coming from the, all the uh, partisan positions. We need to focus on the Cuban people and to listen to what the Cuban people is asking for. 
and the Cuban people is asking for freedom. They are asking for the end of the dictatorship, not the end of the embargo, the end of the dictatorship. That's the conversation that we want to have. That's the conversation that we want you to repeat and to provoke in your, uh, in your social media, in your social networks, with your friends, with the people that you know that can make something. Of course, this is, this is a very hard, this is a very hard struggle. The, we're talking about families, tens of thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of them, but families, citizens, armed, peaceful citizens, confronting an state with all the resources of an state and a criminal state, and a state that has the weapons and that is using that weapons against Cubans. So, of course, resources are necessary, but also political will is necessary. There is something that we have seen once and again taking place in Venezuela, and it's brave people in the streets fighting for recovering their own country and the world failing to them once and again. We cannot let that happen with Cuba. And Cuba could be also the, the hope for Venezuela, for Nicaragua, and to be honest, for, for a pretty good part of, la, of, of, uh, of Latin America. We need both, we need both arms. We need the Cuban people in the streets, they are already, they are already doing, doing, his part, doing their part. We also need the international community becoming the credible threat in the heads of those criminals that are using the weapons against the people. Because those criminals are also very cowards. That's what they are. But they need to be, <laughs> they need to feel the pressure. And that pressure comes from Washington, comes, comes from each democracy in, in Latin America, comes from the European Union, and it's not going to come if, if we do not demand it, if we do not claim for that, if we do not pressure them in order to move and to act now. This is day four of protests in Cuba. All that we have from the White House is the, oh, that is so good, we, are, we stand in solidarity with the Cuban people demanding freedom. Okay, we got it, they are standing, now we need them to act. And those actions, <laughs> those actions are pressuring the repressors. How? They have a lot of, of, of sanctions that could be very targeted. We're not talking about sanction in the state, we're talking about sanction the criminal motherfucker that said that the, that the communists have to go to combat against the Cuban people. And I'm quoting him. And that combat means that there are several kids death today. That's what is taking place in the island. Well, we need actions. We need those sanctions. Magnitsky Act, global mechanisms of sanctions of the European Union, the uh, Treaty of Rio of the, uh, of the member states of the OAS. You don't need to know all these things. You just need to demand action. And those actions are needed in, a, in an urgent way. So that seems that all, all those are things that, that you can help us to do right now. No one's applauding you. Yeah, I, I, no, That's no totally, one no one is applauding you. Trust uh, me. So you tell, I, I don't know what kind of a time crunch you're in. I, and I know that we want to get on with this, but if, I, I, if there is a question or two or something, you know, we can open the floor to that or we can let you go about wherever it is that you have to go. I mean, you're of course welcome to stay, but I know there's a lot of things happening. Uh, so it, 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 does anybody want to, is there a question? Is there a thing? Is there, this is a, this is a three whiskeys deep uh, prompt. Yeah. I mean, from, a, from a Venezuelan, you are on day four, Venezuela's been in years of war, and you're still fighting for what needs to be different in Cuba so it doesn't become another Venezuela where people are tired of fighting and just gave up and lost hope and just migrated to anywhere to do for you? I, I do think that the Venezuelan problem is a Cuban problem and, and vice versa, by the way. Uh, but that vice versa is because now they are lifting sanctions from Venezuela and uh, that's a way of helping the Cuban regime. Because the Venezuelan oil goes to the Cuban regime, even the one that they import. 
goes to uh, goes to the the to the Cuban regime. Um, the Castro regime, that have been the one infiltrated uh, in Venezuela to begin with, that that is actually the the one that directs Maduro, and we have a lot of uh, documentation of that fact. It's just it's just a fact, a very sad one, but it's a fact. And the Castro regime itself is a very old and a very um, rigid structure. Uh, comparisons are just terrible. We, we didn't need to, to make any comparisons between, between the, the suffering of our two peoples. But the, the structure of government in, in Cuba is very different in the sense that, first, we are not taking orders from any other country. The head of the octopus lives in Havana. Second, it's a very rigid, very well-defined pyramid, which is also very old. So hard scenes are easy to break. And what we know for a fact also is not easy, easier. <laughs> what we know for a fact also is that the Cuban regime haven't even been, uh, they, they haven't been even under a half of a pressure that the dictatorship of Nicolás Maduro have been. We have to try because they could break easier. And if they break, well, it's easier to break Maduro, it's easier to break Evo Morales, it's easier to break Nicaragua. They are the actual <coughs> head of the octopus. That are, they are the actual head of the, uh, of the democratic instability in the country. And they are always, always, always trying to put the fight out. If it could be Venezuela, it could be the embargo, it could be the European Union. They are always trying to create a distraction and to create and to and to sell to the international community that the conflict is not the real conflict. The real conflict here is a people <laughs> demanding their freedom against a criminal dictatorship. They of course know they are they are weaknesses, so they prefer to fight in other lands. Well, let's bring the war <laughs> over then. And let's try, because I think we have a very good chance. Fidel Castro is dead, Hugo Chavez is dead, Raúl Castro se está muriendo. Uh, and those sons and grandsons, well, they don't want to see they are, they are flying a space restricted to Havana, Caracas. And they don't want to see all their money around the world just cut. And they don't want to end, to, to, they don't want to end in front of the Hague court. They don't want that. So there's a lot of leverage that could be used and is not being used. Used it. Right? Thank you. Used. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, this is a moment to push those buttons. They're going to run. They're going to run away if we get those buttons pushed. Of course. It's very organic. It's very organic. It's not. This was not a surprise. I mean, from just from January to June 13, there have been more than 1,100 uh, public protests in the streets of Cuba. All the conditions were created for the people to 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 go into the streets. The the, the real question is why it took us that long. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it, having said so, all the leaders of the Cuban opposition, all the uh, known people from the Cuban civil society, they are either in jail or detained in their houses. Of course, they participated. Our network of promoters were participating, and the ones that are still out there are the ones that nobody knows, <laughs> are the ones that are unknown for the military and for the Cuban state security. All the known faces are are some of them facing charges uh, right now so yes the answer is there is no one leader at least no one that we know of
if they actually win this little small battle, what's, what happens next? Yes, and first it's not a small battle. Uh, it's a it's a it's a very it's a very hard one, um, b and it's not a small battle just because if this battle results in a victory, then we have a transition process. That is why it's not a small because the result of this battle is the actual outcome that we have been fighting for sixty two years, um, and. There are some there are some conditions that need to be uh, that need to be complied in order to just take the next step, and those conditions could be uh, could be set, let's say, by different methods. For instance, Cuba de Cide is advocating for a plebiscite, just to ask the Cuban people if if they want the communist regime imposed over. Then for 62 years, or they want free, fair, and multi-party elections. Because if they want free, fair, and multi-party elections, just as they are demanding on the streets, then the whole system has to change. And we go to a transition process, which is actually something that the world knows very well. And we, we need a, a, I don't know how to say assemblea constituyente, I'm so sorry. A constitutional assembly. Thank you. And we need some temporal laws. Uh, all, all, of the, all, all that is already written. That's a way to say it. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what, what I'm trying to say is, those laws have been have agreed have been written by the by the Cuban people in and out the island twenty years ago. We can revisit it. We can we can we can we can update the transition programs. But there is not a lot of place to uh, improvise there. Because uh, we know what happened in Czech Republic, we know what happened in Spain, we know what happened in Chile, and there are some steps that needs to be uh, needs to be taken in order to have finally free, free fair, and multi-party elections. In the Cuban case, you need a complete change of system because the Cuban Constitution just do not allow that. Actually, uh, you could end up killed if you just propose that. So um, I don't know if I'm uh, if I'm explaining myself here. If okay, I actually, that's a great question. <laughs> 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 but but it, but the bottom line is this could this is going to be if this is successful, there is going to be some kind of negotiation with the criminals. That negotiation, if that negotiation is successful, that negotiation is for them to leave. Some conditions have to be. Uh, have to be some preconditions are necessary in order for that to happen. The real scene is here: how are we going to create the pressure for them to have to accept those conditions? You like, would you like the Miami community to get in boats and go to Cuba? Uh, I think that Raúl Castro would love that because part of what. They are thinking is is uh, in blackmailing the the Biden administration with uh, another exodus, right. and that happened in 1980, so, in 1994. So, well-intentioned Miami community that thinks I'd like to get in a boat and go, you would suggest that's not the best plan. Not right now. Not with 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 uh, with American laws, so actually presidential decrees that actually. Uh, prevent the Cubans from uh, just going into Cuba without permission. No, no, that's not, that's not a good idea in, in this moment. I would love to <laughs> go in boat to, uh, and, just, uh, and just arrive in Havana and be part of the protest. But what we know that could happen in this moment when we still do not have that pressure for them to accept those conditions is that they are going to leverage that to pressure the United States, and that's a national security issue. You know something that's, that's and I'm just going to share this very quickly. This is not a question. This is just me sharing. Uh, I was born and raised in Brazil. Um, I'm Middle Eastern, Palestinian, and I live in Palestine. And then out of all the places in the world, I moved to Hialeah, Florida. <laughs> Don't ask me how. Good for you. So when I first moved to Hialeah, I got introduced to the Cuban community. And I learned Spanish. Uh, sorry. So anyway, as I was saying, I, was, I moved to Hialeah, Florida from Brazil and Palestine. And, 
and, and again, I'm just sharing my experience with you guys because growing up in Brazil, the idea of Cuba is a very different idea of what Cuba is. And, and then you go to Palestine, the idea of Cuba is a very different idea of what Cuba is. So when I first moved here um, and I heard the stories firsthand from, from my dad's uh, grocery store in Hialeah, um, I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. So what you said earlier, I just want to share that. Like, don't take for granted what sharing the story of what Cuba really is. Don't say, don't think everybody knows. Because I'm telling you, I was born and raised in Brazil and I lived in the Middle East. And the story of what's actually happened in Cuba is not told anywhere else. So I know when I first moved, I was like, are you, are you sure? And they're like, yeah. I was like, no, but, but, but Raul, uh, not Raul, uh, but Che Guevara, you know, the picture that everybody, sure. you know, uh, 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 the, the iconic picture of Che, like that, that lives everywhere, right? I remember Salt Bay. If you guys remember, he was. He did I remember that loser and I well. Looked at him, and then I was like, and I'm like, he's. He, it's not that he's an ignorant. It's not that he's. It's just the story's not told about Venezuela anywhere. The story's not. The story's not told about Cuba everywhere. So it's oh, super. Yeah, he's gay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has Nailed it. But but I saw that. You know, for me, I was like, it's so important that you guys, the, the, the people that are Cuban are more close to it than us as a Miami uh, community to tell the story every time. Don't take it for granted. Like some people don't know and like you have to share it, post it, talk about it. Cause like when you share it and I share and he shares it and then, and she shares it, it becomes more credible because it's true, but you're fighting against the propaganda, right? So I just wanted to share that cause that happened to me when I first moved to, to Miami. I read today that Russia, China, and Iran asked the U.S. not to get involved in this war, which I thought was really hypocritical. Yeah. Um, and I know that yes. you're asking us to share this story, but what kind of pressure do you think Miami, Florida, and any Cuban, you know, American has to put on the U.S. to do something that I'm not asking to lift the embargo, but to add pressure in ways that can create change or put pressure on you, the regime that's taking place there. Todd's really getting shafted around here, huh? I mean, yeah, it's fine. He'll be fine. <laughs> Nick, you, you can always offer mm. us a drink. <laughs> no, you can always offer us a drink. It's not my restaurant. It's not my restaurant. These people need all the drinks. <laughs> No, I know. It's good. It's yeah, a good it's question. A very, it's a very good question. I think that the pressure comes from the obvious electoral um, approach. Uh, but that's a pressure over both parties. And uh, I just, <laughs> I had a round table with Ron DeSantis yesterday and a round table with Debbie was on my show today. And we are asking the same thing to everybody. And uh, we need then to uh, feel that this is something that they owe the Cuban American community, and this is something that is going to uh, is going to be black and white for the Cuban for the Cuban American community. Having said so, there are very specific things that United States can do. For instance, United States, thank you, United States has the capacity today of offering internet access to the whole island, overcoming the interference of the Cuban regime. It's about 30 million, I think. Uh, but there is an, uh, an appropriation committee in the Congress that could make that happen. Actually, they sent much more money to other countries, and this is a, this is a very critical situation taking place right now. This is a very concrete, practical thing that is going to help a lot that actually has the capacity to save life right now. But there are other more, let's say, more political things that uh, the administration can do. There is something called the Global Magnitsky Act, which is a, 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 a law that the Congress passed to be able to <coughs> sanction individuals that have been involved in serious abuses of human rights in the world. Well, there are a lot of individuals right now in the Cuban regime commanding the troops against the Cuban people. Please act. But not just act. Invite the rest of the world to add something, something positive about 
uh, democratic administration is the fact that they have much more appealing in the rest of the world. Latin America is going to receive better the message that if we were in the previous administration, well, give the message. Take your phone and start to call everybody from Chile to Canada and say, hey, I need you to be with me in this move because the Cuban people need it and the, and the Latin American people need it. And I always see like my Venezuelan brothers, like, you know, friends that say, oh, they didn't do anything in Venezuela, don't expect anything here in Cuba. And it's like, I hate that. I hate that, like, you know, that has to be that way. We can change things, but it is frustrating to see. It I is, know. it is. And if you ask me, there is political will to do so, I don't think that they are going to do it spontaneously. I mean, what I'm telling you is it's kind of basic. They already have the law. Uh, we're not asking for any extraordinary. Actually, why there are so many uh, enterprises still making business with, with, a, with a regime that shut down people in the streets? Why they are not doing with Cuba what they did with South Africa? Why they are not implementing the Sullivan principles and putting consequence on that, on that enterprises? All those things create the leverage that we need in order to build that credible threat that we need to create in the in the in the minds of those of those of those criminals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I have informed the Rosa Maria team that we're gonna be here pretty late. So I don't know what you're doing, but you're welcome to come back and check if we're still around. Okay. And we probably will be. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, I don't, I, I don't know what to say other than thank you for stopping by. I, I can, in Miami of all places, there are a lot of people who would love for you to have stopped by, and uh, this was an absolute uh, privilege. It was the most Pancom podcast thing that has happened in a very long time to interrupt a conversation with Norman Van Aken for uh, Rosa Maria Paya. <laughs> look at this. Look at this. Who, who knew? That's pretty epic. This is, this is yeah. Victory. Victory.